difference. So anyway, uh, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5 this morning. I want to talk to you about the heart of giant killers, but I'm going to do so through the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I didn't get very far in the Sermon on the Mount as far as study, so we're going to make it to the first point of the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> That's as far as I've got. What I want to do is stay on the same lines as what we have been on from, from uh, giant killers to um, breaking through the territory the violent take it by force and all the things that we've been on for about three months now so understanding that i want you to understand where i think we are and where i think we are going um i know most messages are, are for the most part prophetic and i'm not trying to claim this one to be prophetic as much as it is an understanding that we are on the cusp of something so great in the body of christ and right now we are fighting some of the most difficult warfare and i don't mean as individuals yes you are but i mean as the global body of christ it is like the uh, uh the stops have come off and the enemy has pulled out all the stops he has pulled out all the restraints and he is going full force to try to stop to try to destroy what god God's about to do. So what we have in, in history is we have moments of revival and we have moments of awakenings. And there's a great difference between the two. But we are actually scheduled or due, according to a historical repetition, we are due for an awakening and a revival outpouring. That's awesome to me. Just look over the last couple hundred years in the uh, around 1730 or so, uh, the first great awakening began to break out. And uh, you know, th this was um, the preaching of the first great awakening would not last very long today. Jonathan Edwards was one of the uh, spearheads of that great awakening. One of his most famous messages or probably his most famous sermon was sinners in the hands of an angry God. And when he preached that, they actually said that people would clasp onto their, uh, the benches and, the, and leave claw marks literally in the benches. They had men that were hugging up to trees, uh, uh, crying out to God not to let them fall into hell. Now, Jonathan Edwards was not the most gifted orator, but the power of God was on that message so strong because he was bringing a correction to his body. He was about to birth a nation and the people that would birth a nation were the ones that were going to be changed by the great awakening. But first he had to wake the church up before they would have the backbone or audacity to stand up for what was right. We separate church and state. Guess what? God does it. Our government did that so that the government could not control church. And now through, uh, uh, through the digression of our, our uh, system, now we have it that the church can't influence the government. That was never the way it was supposed to be. It was so that the government could not control the church. So now we have a church that's been relegated down to her four walls and she fell asleep. But the alarm clock is set. So, so in the 1730s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, we had this first great awakening and, and uh, with the likes of, uh, of Jonathan Edwards. And then some 50 years later, we had a second great awakening. Matter of fact, the second great awakening was so powerful that toward the middle of it, during the Civil War, they had revival outbreaks in the tents of soldiers in the Civil War. We're waiting for the third great awakening. And we are due. We are overdue. And then we have revivals. I love revivals. An awakening is where God's people are brought awake, shaken awake, or awakened. It is the understanding. It is the renewal of their focus on God. Revival, on the other hand, when I say revival, understand what I mean is a revival outpouring. A revival outpouring is something we saw, we did not see. If you saw this, <laughs> you're older than you look. In the late 1800s, <laughs> I had somebody tell me the other day that, that I did not look old enough to have kids as old as they are. And I said, oh, Lord bless you. I almost went full Catholic. I was <laughs> sprinkle some holy water, bless them. 
In the late 1800s, we saw a revival begin to break out, and, and there was uh, Maria Woodworth Etter was one of the main people that we saw in that, or that were, were uh, prevalent in that, and then she got divorced. Her husband was just a, a very sorry individual, and, and she got divorced, and the church shunned her because she was divorced. However, God did not shun her, amazingly enough. It's amazing the ones that, that the church shuns, God really doesn't shun. Sometimes he shuns the ones that the church accepts. So this, this woman of God was so powerful in revival. She was uh, being moved by the Spirit, operated in the gifts. She was powerful. And then she comes over and joins forces for a season with a man named William J. Seymour, a black gentleman in 1906 in a, in a generation that this was not acceptable. And God began to pour out an outpouring on Azusa Street in Los Angeles. Angeles, California. There was a, a, um, a, a white minister from North Carolina that traveled by train all the way to Los Angeles because he had heard a rumor of what was happening on Azusa Street. And he was so excited that he was going to go get it. <laughs> Whatever it was, he was going to go get it. So he comes in the church to get it and he looks around and there are white people, there are black people, there are Hispanic, there are Asian, there is a, a melting pot of races. And he got so offended that this would dare happen in the house of God. So he leaves and goes to a, uh, 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 his hotel and he is so grieved that he traveled this whole way. And God basically spiritually, uh, uh, as polite as you can say it, spanked him. <laughs> So he goes back and he walks in the church and he finds William J. Seymour and he repents to him for feeling that way. God delivered him of the hate of racism and then poured out a spirit on him. The guy sat there for a week in those meetings, went back, and they had revival break out in his church all the way up the East Coast. These are revival outpourings. And then that began to die out. And then some woman named Amy Simple McPherson came on the scene in a day that women were not supposed to be in ministry. Not that some things have changed a whole lot, if you ask some. I'm going to leave that all alone. If you haven't seen some of the, the, the religious news lately, you didn't get that. But there are, there's a war going on whether women should teach or not. Anyway, I thought we'd move past that. So Amy Simple McPherson began to see an outpouring of healings. And then we have the healing moves of the 40s and 50s. We had uh, 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 Catherine Kuhlman and Oral Roberts and William Brannon and A.A. A. Allen and so many that were so used by God during this season. And then we had something fresh and new in the late 60s coinciding with what Woodstock and Haight Ashbury brought. We had God move within his church with a charismatic renewal and the likes of people like John Wimber begin to see a charismatic outpouring across the nation. And then we move into the 80s and we had the word movement where people were actually brought back into the study and the knowledge and the understanding of what scripture really is. And then we had something really powerful. We had the charismatic movement to the charismatic renewal come over here and mingle with the word movement. And when they mingled and they began to coincide, all of a sudden we had the outpouring of the 90s. Now, the outpouring of the 90s was awesome. I mean, God really broke some theologies. I've read a lot about Brownsville. And I heard a lot of stories from John Kilpatrick, but Miss Renita posted an article there or, or a, a thing the other day that gave uh, a portion of that that I had not heard. On the day that outpouring broke out in Brownsville, uh, it was Father's Day, and John Kilpatrick was the pastor, and he did not want to preach that day, and he asked Steve Hill to preach. So they come in, and Steve Hill begins to preach, and then he wants to pray for people. So as the pastor, John Kilpatrick was rather irritated 
because it's Father's Day and we got a we got a schedule to keep and we have to get home so people can spend time with their families and yada yada yada. And the more Steve began to pray for people, the more irritated Pastor John became. And the more he went and the more he irritated he became. And finally he said, God just shut him up. So God shut the man up. Just not Steve Hill. He knocked John Kilpatrick on the floor and that man didn't get up off the floor until 6 p.m. that night. Sometimes God has to get us out of the way. Amen. What's my point? My point is very simple. God's been moving continuously and there is a repetition to these cycles. There's a pattern and I'm not saying God is confined by a pattern. What I am saying is that we can begin to see if fall comes every year around the same time, the next year you can predict falls coming. In Louisiana, it's very negotiable. We have eight seasons, and they all happen in the same day. So, I mean, you just kind of got to. But when there's a, pa a pattern and a cycle, so what happens? Well, you can look all the way back to Genesis and find the same pattern. God's people draw close to God. God blesses them. They begin to pull away from God. God's hand of favor removes from, from his people. They cry out to God. Oh, God, why have you left us? Why do you persecute us? And then God restores back his favor, and they walk in blessing, and they get spoiled in their blessing, and they pull away from God, and then God removes his favor. Do you get the pattern so in the 90s we got spoiled in revival I was listening to a minister the other day and I was a little surprised over uh, some of the things that he had said but uh, one of them he gave an example he was supposed to speak at a church at a conference um, in, in the late 90s and there was a well-known female minister speaking the night before and she was scheduled to start speaking at 8 o'clock sharp so 8 o'clock rolled around she wasn't there 8.30, 9 o'clock, 9.30, 10, 10.30, 11 o'clock, she shows up. I've never been that late. <laughs> so 11 o'clock, she shows up, and she comes in with her entourage, and she demands that the first two rows of people are, are uh, removed so that her entourage can have somewhere to sit. She also sent out a list of demands, and amongst those demands to the pastor before she would even come was a meal prepared after the service, a buffet meal of certain meats and certain things, and it was a $3,000 expense to the church just to feed this little entourage, so they did it. And come to find out the reason she was late was because she demanded a white limousine pick her up, and when they showed up in a black limousine, it would not work. See, in the late 90s, what happened was we experienced such a great revival and man began to confuse the move of God from God with them. On the triumphal entry, when Jesus came into the city on the Passover week, he came riding in on a donkey. So if you look through the eyes of a donkey, he's riding in and everybody's laying the branches over. That donkey could have very well thought... <laughs> I am so special. Donkey is here. <laughs> he could have thought it was about him. It had nothing to do with the donkey. It was Jesus that came in. Well, sometimes ministers fail to realize it has nothing to do with the donkey. It has to do with Jesus. So then we begin to see the move begin to be perverted by selfish motive and man's desires. And we begin to make superstars of men. Men are not superstars. If you put your faith in a man, you will be disappointed. Not some of the time. Every single time. So we made idols out of them. And now every time a, a, a minister fails and falls and, and falls into uh, a guilt of some sort, then all of a sudden masses of people leave church altogether because they put their faith in a man. So guess what? God had to correct what was happening? There were excesses that were not of God. God loves to bless his people. But the moment we get focused on the blessing and not on God, we've lost it. You can believe that God's going to bring you a Mercedes for free. Last time I checked, they're not for free. 
You can believe that you're going to have a mansion on a hill for free. I will visit you if it happens. Don't get me wrong. I will, I will apologize for being wrong. But last time I checked, they came with a, with a mortgage. I mean, I don't know about the mansion on the hill, but they say it does. When our focus gets on things, we've lost it. So the revival of the 90s was about the presence of God. And all of a sudden, the ministers, I'm referring to ministers. I'm going to be a little critical of ministers this morning, if that's all right. Pastor's appreciation, I guess that's appropriate. <laughs> I haven't even got to my notes, and the first three pages are an introduction. So, so we'll have to see where this goes. Ministers begin to use the prosperity message as a self-seeking, money-making, late-night television scam. Have y'all ever been up in the middle of the night and this guy that, that's sitting on, uh, on the porch of this beautiful house and he's got his Lamborghini, his Ferrari in the background saying, you can make millions just like me without even working. <laughs> I pulled up one of those guys one time just out of curiosity and he filed bankruptcy six times. He was only 30. I couldn't figure out how you did that, but it was businesses that he had. He was, that house on the infomercial wasn't even his. <laughs> but see, ministers began to promote it, the gospel the same way. So God had to remove. We had to go through a hard season. Deuteronomy chapter 8, I'll suffer you to hunger so that you will know that man lives uh, uh, not by bread, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He has to bring us to a place that we are dependent on him. So here we are. We've been through a season of nearly 20 years where revival has waned in our nation and it's been a struggle. And then all of a sudden, about 10 years ago, there was a stirring of prophetic words about a and awakening and about the prayer movement rising and about rural revivals taking place and about God drawing people to little houses, to little places, to little churches in rural areas because he was going to set them on fire and ignite them with revival and it wouldn't be about a denomination or a particular preacher or a big city. It would be about the glory of God released. Oh, that's so good. Yes, I've put our name on the list. I've signed up. Let us be a glory house. Let us be a place marked by the glory of God. Do you know, how about this? There's a great purpose to the glory of God. We need it, no doubt. But the world needs it. It is not a matter of how good of a preacher you are or are not. It is not a matter of how well you can build a ministry or well you cannot. The transformation of a person comes from God. You and I have never saved a single person. I don't care how many people you've led to Christ, you never saved them. Only Jesus saved them. You took part in ministering the gospel to them that brought them to a decision that they made, but you did not save them. You never healed anyone, no matter how many people you've prayed for that were healed. Only God is the healer. We need the glory of God. There are some people that would never set foot in this church because they don't like my hair, my suit, or they don't like you. Ha! But when the glory of God is here and they hear something's going on, then they will walk in with all their uh, colorful tattoos and colorful hair and mohawks and anything else. And when they walk in the doors, the power of God will change them. Amen. During the Brownsville revival, they came to John Kilpatrick and they said, uh, Pastor, there's a problem. He said, what? And they said, I walked through the foyer and I smell marijuana. And he said, great, the potheads are here. He had one man that was in line and he was interviewed by, by the local news and they said, sir, where are you from? And he said, I'm from Michigan or something like that. He was in leather chaps and pants and a vest and that was it. And he had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and they said, 
are you here for the revival? He said, I have no idea why I'm here. <laughs> and they said, well, well, why are you here? <laughs> and he said, all I know is I was taking my, my motorcycle for a ride down the road, and I heard this voice over the motor that said, go to Florida. So I started headed to Florida, and then the voice said, go to Brownsville. So I came to Brownsville, and it said, turn here and turn here. I just pulled up a few minutes ago and got in line. There's a bunch of people. I figured something's happening. That's God. It wasn't Steve Hill or John Kilpatrick. It was the glory of God released. We need the glory of God restored back to his houses because there's a dying world and they're going to hell unless God touches them and they won't come for you and they won't come for me, but they will come for him. That's so good. All right, now y'all turn to Matthew 5. I think. Let's talk for a moment about the anointing and the glory. I love the glory, amen? The word glory, there's two words for glory. It is doxa and kabod. And the word Doxa and the word kabod. Kabod means a uh, very simply weight, heaviness, splendor. Doxa uh, uh, means uh, uh, his glory, his honor, his dignity, his praise. But if you get down to the root word of the word glory, it means opinion. I like this because when we come into the glory of God, we come into the place where his thoughts are. We come to where his opinions are. See, because the anointing is different. The anointing is mashak or, or a charisma, and it means an unction or a special endowment of power. So the anointing comes on you to accomplish something that you in and of yourself cannot accomplish. So God has you in a strategic moment, in a strategic place, and the anointing comes on you to do something. And that's great. Amen. But the anointing is his power to accomplish something. So whether you are a David where the anointing comes on you to kill Goliath or you are a donkey as a Balaam. I'm on the donkey thing today and I had no intention to. But Balaam's donkey, the anointing came on him and he spoke to Balaam. So whichever spectrum you are on, the anointing can come on you to accomplish what God wants you to accomplish. The anointing of God came on Pharaoh. He actually hardened Pharaoh's heart to cause him not to release the people so that when it got bad enough, he would be so tired of the people that he would push them out. That's the anointing. The glory is where we meet God's heart. Proverbs 25, 2 says the secret uh, says, uh, let me give you the right verse because I'm about to give you Deuteronomy. The glory of God is. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings to search things out. I like the way the Passion Translation gives this. God conceals the revelation of his word in the hiding place of his glory. But the honor of kings is revealed by how thoroughly they search out the deeper meaning of what God says. So it's in his glory, his place of opinion. Now, the glory of God is the manifest, tangible presence of God, right? So this is where the, that we, we begin to hear the voice of the Lord, and it opens up his heart. This is where we find the heart of God. So we're talking about giant killers, or will eventually. David was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because David spent time searching the glory of God. Even though the anointing came on David, he was not a seeker of the anointing. He he did not seek the throne. He did not seek success. He sought the glory of God. And in the glory of God, he was made into the man that could walk carrying the anointing. Oh, that's so good. See, we, we can at times, especially as ministers, we can get so much more focused on, on the anointing. Because I want to get up and preach a good message. Amen. If I struggle through the message and I forget who you people are, <laughs> I forget who I am, 
There are sometimes you're preaching and it's almost like like the the brain just kind of shorts out. There's a spark plug that needs to be replaced. Amen. So I, I look down, I look up and it's like, ooh. How did I get here? I have been translated and I'm not even Philip. There's moments that I look down and all the words begin to run together and I'm like, them glasses did not work. <laughs> there are days that I leave the pulpit thinking, why have we not put that exit in the back yet? When we build a new building, I, I have, I'm, I'm seriously going to talk to a contractor about a little slide right here. And I'm going to press a button that way I can slide out and then a hologram is going to pop up on the last good message. <laughs> Me and Miss Sandy are, are, are uh, conspiring together on this. See, the anointing is great because I want to step up and I want to feel the power of God to deliver his message with authority and with power. That is great and that is wonderful. But if I'm not experiencing God's glory, the anointing does not matter to me. It does nothing for me if I haven't been in his glory. So I can get up and my heart is riddled and I'm living a secret life and I've got all of this filth and junk back here that you can't see because I can step up and get into the anointing. We got to be more worried about the glory than the anointing. The anointing will come. Don't worry. But it's the glory we got to focus on. So let's look at Matthew chapter 5. We're going we're gonna to look at pieces of 5, 6, and 7. I'm not going to go through the whole Sermon on the Mount. I preached long enough. Jesus preached long too. So I'm going to hit just a few points. But let's start with the beatitude. Yeah, that was singular. Because we don't have time to get into the other ones. I hadn't even got through my introduction, so you do not want me to go through all these. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is, this is neat. First off, let me, let me point out, the word opened in verse 2. It says he opened his mouth is what the King James says. That word open, this is going to be very profound to you word scholars. The word open means to open up. I know. Shaking. But when I saw that, it kind of caught me funny. So I look at it and I'm, I'm thinking the word open means to open up. As brilliant as that is, it makes a better sense to me. Because when Jesus sat down and he began to speak, he began to open up his word. It says that he opened his mouth and taught them. Well, when Jesus comes into a situation and he opens his mouth or releases his word, it brings revelation to what's happening. That's the prophetic word. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there is a veil over our faces. Until the Holy Spirit removes that veil, we can't really understand what is in Scripture anyway. So that means that when Jesus sat down with them and he began to speak, he removed the veil so that their carnal eyes could see through the Spirit and understand what he was saying. Now there's a misconception in the church today that Jesus came and gave us grace to do whatever we wanted to do. But he starts out in the Sermon on the Mount by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The word poor means impoverished. It means weak. To be poor in spirit means that you are unable in and of yourself to provide or to accomplish anything in the spirit. So when Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, he said, blessed are those that are 100% completely dependent on God. Wouldn't that be great? 
He says blessed. The word blessed is happy. It is joyful. It is complete. It is abundant blessing. He says blessed is the one who understands that it's not in their power nor their might. Blessed is the one who understands it's not in his intellect. It's not in his education. It's not in his experience. It's not in his ability to talk. Because guess what? I've heard some good motivational speakers and they can sound just like a good charismatic preacher. And they can even go <laughs> and then they can use the foulest language through their thing and they can even quote some verses in the middle of it because they are great life coaches and motivational speakers but it has nothing to do with God some of the greatest ministers were some of the most I don't want to say boring. Some of them really had a hard time in, in, in delivering a message. Smith Wigglesworth one time leaned down and, and toward the end of his life, he could not see well. So he would have to get right here to read. I'm, I'm, I'm really sympathizing it some days. So one day he's reading and all he did was read straight from the text. So he begins to sit down like this and, and he's reading the text and the power of God came in the place and everybody in the place went out slain. People were being healed. People were being delivered. And he looked up and saw everybody laying down and looked like that and thought they all went to sleep. Now, if I look out and all y'all are laying down, I don't think... Lord, they're slain and snoring. <laughs> Jesus said the very beginning of this. He said, you need to understand that blessed is the one who is a beggar in the spirit. The word actually means to beg. To not be able to provide in and of yourself. Now, God does not want a beat down church. If, you, if you've ever heard this, this, um, this passage preached, a lot of uh, well-intending ministers really take this to be a brow-beating verse. You've got to beat your head, be, uh, beat this over your head, and you not only do you have to be poor in spirit, but you need to be poor in every way. So we should all be just, you know, downtrodden and... That's not what it says. It's talking about walking in a dependency to God. It's talking about walking so close to the Lord that you understand you need His wisdom on every decision you make. Walking so close to the Lord that you need His favor in everything you do. Walking so close to the Lord that you need His discernment every time you walk into a building. There was a, 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 a pastor and his wife, and I've given this story a few times, if I give it enough times, I may change some of the details, so forgive me if some of them aren't perfect. But there was a pastor and his wife laying in, in bed one night. They were asleep, and the wife woke up, and she began to intercede. She had a, the, the pressure of intercession come over her, and she began to intercede. And she woke her husband up like a, a good pastor's wife would do. She said, pray with me, honey. God has laid a burden on my heart, and I don't know who it's for. So the pastor began to pray, and, and, and 30 seconds flat, he fell asleep. You can't imagine that one, can you? <laughs> so she woke him up again and he said, babe, I can't stay awake. Obviously, God has not placed this burden on me. It's on you. So she prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And finally, she said, Lord, I don't know who this is for, but please give them a dream that will stop them from making this mistake. So the next day, one of their uh, uh, congregants went to work and he worked construction and he walked in and his boss came over to him and he said, man, I need you uh, to, to do so-and-so's job. He called in sick today. I need you to go up there and change a cable out. And he said, no, sir, not even. And he said, why? He said, last night I had a dream that that guy didn't come into work and you told me to go do his job. And when I went up there, the cable broke and it killed me. And there was a gentleman standing by who was also a believer. A church-going, God-loving, God-fearing believer. 
And he said, I don't believe in all of that hogwash. I'll go do it. The cable broke and ended his life. We need to walk in such great discernment that we pull into a parking lot and something's not right. And the quickening of the Holy Spirit says, hey, you don't need to be here. Go home. I'm not talking about pulling up into a, a, a gang club. I'm talking about pulling up into the grocery store or a fast food restaurant. I'm talking about deserting by the Spirit when something is not right. We need the discernment of God. We need the leading of the Lord. When the Lord comes on us and we begin to discern that the person behind the counter is hurting and desperate for somebody just to say, I love you. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the ones who are so dependent on God. Oh, if the church of the 90s had remained so dependent on the Lord. Who knows what kind of revival we'd be seeing right now. Let me give you this, this in, the, in the CEV. This is neat. God blesses the people who only depend on him. The passion says that what wealth is offered up to you when you feel your spiritual poverty, for there is no charge to enter into the realm of of heaven's kingdom. So a poor in spirit is a humble spirit. In James chapter 4, it says that God resists the proud. It actually, is, James chapter 4 is a warning on self-seeking. He says, you ask and you don't receive because you don't ask in the right heart. Your selfish desires have pushed you to ask for things that you shouldn't be asking for. And then when you don't get them, you are moved into jealousy and you are moved into anger and you are moved into hate. For God is at enmity with the world, but he gives great grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. So, so Jesus here, he says, blessed is the one who is completely dependent on the Lord. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the humble in spirit. That's so good. Humility is hard to find. Sometimes it, it, with, in anything in life, we, we begin to have some success and we begin to think that it's our experiences or our wisdom or our great training that has given us the ability to have great success. And it's really not. Not when we rely on the Lord. God can give you success that your education, training and experience and wisdom and knowledge and all of that great stuff cannot give you. He can open up doors that no man can shut. Amen. So look at part B of that verse. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now this is neat. Because it does not say theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. It does not say one day the kingdom of heaven will be theirs. It does not say the kingdom of heaven could have been theirs or was theirs in the past, that is a present tense verse. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The kingdom of heaven refers to the power and the authority of heaven. Now, in this same passage, you have to, to uh, hold chapters 5, 6, and 7 together, because this is the Sermon on the Mount. In this same sermon, while Jesus was preaching, he starts out by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. But it's not many verses. It's in the middle of chapter 6. So right in the middle, right in the meat of this message of this sermon, Jesus turns around and says, pray after this. Oh, our Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, this is right after he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they, uh, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And then he turns around and says, you pray that the power and the authority of heaven invade this earth in the here and now. But it starts with the people who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and right, uh, thirst after righteousness. Now that's something you don't teach anymore. Hunger and thirst and after righteousness. 
Later in chapter 6, he says, Seek first the kingdom of God, all his righteousness, all things, all these things will be added. He goes through and he says, Guys, look, you're worried about what you're going to eat. You're going to worry about the clothes that are on your back. But don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry for itself. And we all know that's true. He says, But for those who seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness... These things will be taken care of. It does not say just because you, you come to church that these things will be take, taken care of. It does not say because you memorized your memory verse and got a gold star that these things will be taken care of. It says for those who seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's so good. Look over. If you, if you follow this thing out, man, this is amazing. Jesus is obviously the best preacher ever. But he really laid this out. And you think I jump from some topics. I mean, these three chapters really jump over some stuff. But he goes through the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But what if the salt has lost its taste? How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. This is where I fear much of the church has gone in America today. We lost our saltiness. There's two things it talks about with the people uh, uh, through here. It talks about their saltiness and it talks about uh, the integrity. And uh, when we look at the church today, we've lost both. We have two great spectrums in the, in the church in America today. We, we have over here a very a, a hardcore church that condemns everything and over here we have a very loose church that condones everything and neither one of them are standing in the balance of, wor of the word of God God has such great grace and he loves the sinner but he does not condone the sin so Jesus goes on, he says, you've lost your saltiness. And then he comes to verse 17. Do you think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets? I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot will pass from the law until it is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, you unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven Jesus did not preach an easy going message this is why he took 5,000 down to 12 and one of the 12 was uh, uh, was there to to uh, uh, to tr be a traitor talk about church growth scripture style he said I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. That means that Jesus came to actually fulfill the requirements of the law on this earth that no man could do. No matter how good we are or try to be or no matter how self-controlled we can be, we will never live up to the requirements of the law. We're not meant to. That's why the law was there to show us that we cannot. Only Jesus could live up to the measurements of the law. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. So what does it mean to come and fulfill the law? It means that he came to give us the power over the law. This is why Paul could say we're not bound by the restriction of the law anymore. For we have overcome the law. Why have we overcome the law? Because the one that put his spirit inside of us actually gave us the power to overcome what the law was trying to attack. So the law, he goes on to say, anger. Verse 21, you've been told that it's wrong to murder someone. But I tell you, if you've hated your brother, you've already murdered him. So we are not in this room. Everyone in this room is not guilty of murder. Amen. Ooh. <laughs> okay, the sermon is really about to change. <laughs> I did not think you were guilty of murder. I have not, awareness anyway, 
Y'all are scared me a little bit. I'm going to watch how I preach from now on. I said, y'all are not guilty of murder. Only three people said amen. I am worried about y'all. Lord, I thank you. You are a shield about me. But we're all guilty of anger. We've all been moved in a season in our life where we hated someone, even if it was for a short time. He goes on and say, uh, in, in verse 27, you say it's wrong to commit adultery. But I tell you, it's wrong to lust for if you've lusted, you've already committed adultery. Guess what? We may not have all committed adultery, but at some point in our life, we've all lusted. Everybody be quiet. He goes on about divorce, oaths, retaliation. And he tells us one by one by one by one. And he goes to the heart of it. And he says, you cannot overcome the heart of it. But according to Romans chapter 8, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of me. And that same spirit can quicken my mortal body. And when I take that spirit to overcome the work of sin, I become a son or a daughter of God. I'm a son. You can be a daughter. You know what that means when Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. He said, I've come to give you the one, the spirit inside of you that can actually overcome the desire to do these things. It's great that you've walked your life and never murdered anyone for the three of you that said amen. But what if you could walk your life and never walk in anger toward anyone? Fifty-seven percent of ministers confess to regularly viewing pornography. Fifty-seven percent. If it's that bad behind the pulpits, how bad is it in the churches? Let's just be honest. What if God gave us the power to overcome the temptation of the world? He did. According to James, God does not tempt us. If you ever say God tempted you with sin, please don't. James says God does not tempt us with sin. He cannot be tempted with sin. Our own desires play in our minds and they begin to conceive thoughts. And when those thoughts bring action, they birth sin and sin brings forth death. That's according to James chapter one. So what happens is the enemy knows your weakness and he begins to play on you and taunt you and tempt you. And then you begin to uh, uh, play with these thoughts. And when you play with these thoughts, they birth sin in your mind. But Jesus said, I've given you the spirit because of his ministry his death his burial his resurrection and the outpouring of his spirit in Acts chapter 2 we have the spirit inside of us that can overcome the very sin nature and it does not mean it's a given it doesn't just mean you say a salvation prayer and boom you've overcome every temptation oh I'm not tempted by anything <laughs> driving traffic and let's just see how many people you murder according to that passage I like it when they wait till you get right there when it's raining and then pull out and do 20 miles an hour in a, in a 55 zone. How many of you stop as you swerve to miss them and hope that you don't flip in the process and go, oh, Lord, bless them. <laughs> Pour your spirit out on that genius. I declare the blessing in the favor of God. Lord, I declare healing to their sight. I, I probably have said that. <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit because the poor in spirit, when Jesus says a verse like this, see, see the church, we're at a place that if you say something somebody doesn't like, they'll leave your church. I know of a church that there was a, a gentleman that on some Sundays he would bring his wife and on other Sundays he would bring his girlfriend. And the preacher was told, don't you dare say a word about adultery. Because <laughs> he was the biggest giver in the church. Very large church. Guess what? Let me just tell you, husband, something. I know your wives. <laughs> and if you bring a girlfriend, I can go ahead and tell you, we're going to be talking about this anger part. <laughs> because they will not have the sin in their heart. They will do it. See, in church today, if we offend somebody, they leave. 
But Jesus didn't care who walked away. He cared who stayed. See, there are churches that will tell their people, even though we believe in the gifts of the Spirit, don't practice them in the church. We don't want to offend somebody. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit has always been offensive because he did not come. Jesus did not come to bring unity. He came to divide. Why? Because he came to set the world on fire. Luke chapter 12. That's what he said. Because when we join with God... When we believe him at his word, something happens in the spirit realm because we are divided from the world. And if someone won't divide from the world, then they don't like how we believe. I'll tell you something else. The division between churches and denominations, we need to let that junk go. Now, we are to be divided from the world. Amen. Salt and light. You can't be salt and light if you're stuck in the mud. However, just because we have a different theological interpretation of certain verses and some believe a little bit differently, I'm not talking about the fundamentals of faith. I'm talking about the interpretation of some things. Then when we begin to argue over those things, we are actually hurting our brothers. And guess what? I am so stubborn that you are not going to convince me with all of your doctrinal arguments. And I know that the people that I love that don't believe the same, they are so stubborn in their beliefs that I'm not going to be able to argue them out of it. If God wants to change them, may he change them. Outside of that, we will agree on what we agree on and march together, join in unity based on what we do agree on because greater are we together than we could ever be divided. See, the church has to stand together. That's why I, I have a lot of compassion for our president. I still think that somebody needs to take a bar of soap from, from time to time. Wash his mouth out. Lava soap on some days. I mean, we ain't talking about dawn. We're talking about some lava. We need to get some of that really cleansed. However, the man has every force of darkness in this nation coming against him, and the church is divided on who will support him or not because he doesn't fit our mold. If God put the one in office that fit our mold, we would be in trouble. Rodney Howard Brown has a church down in, in Florida, and during the presidential elections, he invited uh, uh, the, the um, front-running Republican to come and speak at his church. And the guy said, absolutely, I'll be there. And then as it got close to time to come, he called him and he said, you know, uh, my, my advisors are telling me it would not be politically advantageous for me to come to your church because of the way you guys believe. Well, they're spirit-filled, so that's, that's, uh, that's a no-no. So Rodney Howard Brown said, I understand. So he reached out to Donald Trump and said, would you come to my church? And Donald Trump, you know, since he just cares so much what everybody thinks, he says, I'll be there. <laughs> and he came and he let them pray over him. He goes to another church that, that was a little uh, uh, edgy for the norm. And, and that, that pastor wanted to pray over him and prophesy over him. Whew. So now in this season, the witching season of this holiday season, we have witches around our nation that have vowed to attack and to destroy that man. And this last three days, they have gone into a time of fasting to destroy him. And just to show just how powerful they are, God allowed Trump to lead an attack and take out Baghdadi, the head of ISIS. I've had two calls this morning. Do you know Baghdadi's dead? <laughs> well, the first one, I was on my way to church, and I was, I was reading it. And I was like, Big Daddy? <laughs> Poor Big Daddy. <laughs> Trump killed Big Daddy. Then <laughs> 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 once I had it back here a little bit... <laughs> I left my glasses at the church. Once you pull it back far enough, oh, back daddy. <laughs> Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. See, God doesn't ask your opinion. Or how about this? He may ask your opinion, but he is sure never asked mine. God is so good. 
Now, I, I'm not going to stand up here and, and tell you that, that I agree with everything our president does, and I'm not going to tell you that he's some holy man. That's between him and God. I wouldn't have told you that about any of our presidents, no matter how good they seemed or how not good they seemed. What I can tell you is he's allowing God to use him. He's listening to the prophetic voices that are being spoken to him, and God's using him. And I pray for our president. I pray protection around him. I pray God will speak to him. I did that for President Obama the same way. I did it for President Bush the same way. I, did I do it for Clinton? I think I did. <laughs> I did. I do remember. I prayed for President Clinton. <laughs> I didn't say it worked. I just said I did it. Let me give you a couple more points, and our, our worship team can go ahead and come. I'm, I'm going to. Y'all got me off point. I know it was y'all's fault. Because I was trying to be poor in spirit and y'all got me all. In, in, in Psalms, I love this. Let me give you a real good point here. Because poor in spirit means we take correction of the Lord. Amen. Every single one of us need correction. Scripture is given for our correction, for our reproof. Right? So if you are not corrected, if you do not receive the correction of the Lord, whether it comes through Scripture or a person that God has placed over you, then you are operating in rebellion and disobedience. And that's between you and God. I'm not talking about taking the bad, badgery of people, but let's just be straight up honest. Aren't you glad your parents corrected you when you were little? And the older you get, the smarter your parents become until the merging of the two come together. And then all of a sudden you say things and you sound just like your parents. And it is that 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 epiphany moment of, oh, I've become them. And then you realize what a great honor that is. So we need correction and reproof. So Jesus is correcting the body right here. He's telling them. He's coming against the Pharisees. He's coming against the Sadducees. He's coming against the Gentiles. He's coming against anybody that does not completely align. He says, you think that I've come to, to, uh, to bring a, a kingdom, and I have, but it's a spiritual kingdom. And so we have this idea that Jesus come to cover all of our sins in grace so that we can continue sinning. No, he came to forgive our sins through his grace but to give us the power to overcome the very sin nature and as we overcome the sin nature we begin to cry out and we begin to hunger and thirst for his righteousness where is his righteousness found it's in his glory when we spend time in his glory we are not changed y'all quiet we are transformed I don't just want to be changed because if I'm changed, I'm, I'm going to need some more changing. But God will transform us from glory to glory to glory to glory. It's a never ending process. We are getting closer to looking like Jesus every single day that we come into his glory. And every single day that we don't, we're moving the other way. My dad used to say, you are not ever standing still spiritually. You're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. We're either being transformed from glory to glory or we're being changed from mud to mud. Let me give you just a couple last things. I'm going to be quick this last part. Have faith in me. You're my wife. You're so, I heard that. <laughs> I'm going to give you these verses. You don't have to turn there because... To be uh, real quick, Psalms chapter 119, verses 67, 71, 72, and 92. And we'll back up to 75 as well. So let me give you those again. Chapter 119 of Psalms, verses 67, 71, 72, 75, 92. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I know now, O Lord, that your judgments are right and your faithfulness, in your faithfulness you have afflicted me. So let's put that to what I begin with at the very start of this. It was the church era that we are in. We are on the cusp of a great awakening and a revival outpouring together. But what's happened is so much of the church, we have seen the affliction of the Lord. 
Now, that's not a popular term either. But what happened was he began to remove his spirit from revival. He began to remove that. Not that we couldn't access his spirit or his glory, because we have. I'm not saying that, but I'm talking about the move of his glory that came so abundantly. He moved that back to correct his people. So that is an affliction. When we go through a season without revival, that is an affliction. He says, I've given you this affliction. So the church remnant is coming to a place that we can say, God, the lack of your revival has made me a lover of your law. I was no longer just pursuing the blessing that the preachers preach about, but I began to pursue you, and I found out there's so much more to you than name it, claim it. I found out there's so much more to you than fundraising. I found out there's so much more to you than feeling good about my filth. I found out there's something so much more to you than just having success in any given day. But God, you've called me for a purpose, and that purpose is to be in your glory and to deliver your glory to bring forth the kingdom of heaven in the earth today oh thank you God that's the awakening of the church that's the church that's beginning to wake up so if you'll stand this morning I'll give you three points I would give you a poem but all I got is three points I could ask you how many of you want to walk closer to the Lord, how many of you want to walk in in such great discernment, and how many want to hear the voice of the Lord, but I think those three answers go without saying. So let me give you three points. Number one, be poor in spirit. Number one, be humble in spirit. Be a beggar of the spirit. Oh God, I even beg you for your spirit in my life. Lord, accomplish what I cannot accomplish on my own. Number two, fear God. Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Revelations 14, 6 and 7 says that I saw another angel flying directly overhead with the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. I believe that the fear of the Lord is returning to the pulpits and the fear of God is returning to the churches. Number three, final point, find the glory of the Lord and stay in that place as much as you possibly can. It has nothing to do with what people see. It's not that you can go out and and say some big prayer in public so that everybody can see. There's nothing wrong with that. It has to do with what you are doing in private by yourself when you're driving down the road in your car, when you're lying in, in the bed at night. Find a way to feel His glory.